Good afternoon. Um, this is Alex Schneider. I, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm presenting on the um, Pullman cars assigned to the New York Central Railroad. So let me see if I can get this thing beginning. Okay, this talk covers four Pullman plans that were introduced between 1910 and 1914 which were either built for the New York Central assignment or they were so assigned before U.S. entry into World War I in 1917. And in all cases, they had no sections, all revenue space with either compartments or a compartment and drawing room mix. After accidents in the Park Avenue tunnel in which we- This park covers four Pullman plans. Um, New York City mandated use of steel cars in tunnels within the city. Steam locomotives were banned at the same time. The mandate took effect about 1912, initially applied to New York Central and New Haven operations into Grand Central, and to Pennsylvania and Long Island Railroad when Penn Station opened. Pullman built its first steel sleeping car in 1907 and refined the design about 1910. And within three years of that date, Pullman had completed over 1,100 steel sleeping cars and nearly 200 steel parlor cars, most of which were assigned to the New York Central, the Pennsylvania, and the New Haven because their trains carried all Pullman service that ran into New York City. Early Pullman car plans offering compartments included the following. Plan 2505, consisting of 10 compartments. Plan 2522, seven compartments and two drawing rooms. Plan 2540, eight compartments and an observation lounge. And plan 2413, six compartments and an observation lounge. Most of these plans were built for other roads as well as for New York Central. And the arrangement of accommodations in each of these cars was little changed from the last decade or so of wooden car designs. For instance, the configuration of Plan 2522 had been used earlier on wood cars of Plan 1845 built for the Santa Fe and Rock Island. Until new Pullman orders began to arrive in 1923 to 25, these cars were the best New York Central had to offer on its top trains. The 20th Century Limited, the Southwestern Limited, the Lakeshore Limited, and the Wolverine. So here's the first one. Rondax is an example of a 10 compartment car, one of the earliest all steel sleeping cars. In Tom Madden's classification team, it's known as um, phase one. And the frosted Gothic windows here at the top of the window areas for each section and the oval topped washroom windows are notable features distinguishing a plan one or phase one car. There's another example, Highland Falls, built in 1914, specifically for New York Central Service. Now, I, in 1926, the Catholic Church held a Eucharistic Congress in Chicago, and the New York Central operated a special cardinals train to the event for the prelates coming from over, and it was ran, run as a section of the 20th Century Limited. Sunderland was among the cars chosen for this, which were temporarily painted red and renamed for the occasion. Notice that a extended letter board has covered over the Gothic windows such cars featured when they were originally built. The initial service of the cars was on the 20th Century Limited, but they continued in other trains for a number of years up till about 1930 on the New York Central, at which time they ceased to be regularly assigned in that service. Apparently the plan wasn't all that successful because it um, wasn't repeated after uh, the 1914 period. But in 1925, three of the cars were rebuilt with a lounge and reassigned to Washington to Montreal service. And uh, they, received air conditioning. 
In addition, Ridgeville was used in the Rexall chartered train in 1936. The the fact that only five of the cars of this plan received air conditioning suggested that they weren't particularly highly regarded. So Ridgeville and Sunderland, which were two air conditioned cars that weren't reconfigured, were sold to Royal American shows in 1958. And probably the car in the foreground is one of them. The second plan, 2522, seven compartments and two drawing rooms, of which Cochiti is an example. It was built in 1911 for general service, and the photo was taken at the Pullman Works in Chicago. While it's not easily seen in a distant photo like this, such early cars had vertical steel siding in strips or sheets that appeared similar to wood siding. Apparently, some early passengers feared that a steel car would be more dangerous if the car was struck by lightning. Now, I'm going to discuss this plan in two phases, the early cars built before U.S. entry into World War I. And I'm also going to discuss as a separate group a lot built in 1923, which incorporated a number of design changes. But here's an early one. Like many early Pullman exterior photos, the print was made from a glass plate negative to which a paper mask was glued for printing. The mask was created by printing the negative and then cutting out the image of the car to be produced. Here's another example taken from some classic trains because access to the Smithsonian Library to get direct prints is currently interrupted by the pandemic. I'm surprised a little at Dubin's comment about striping, because by the time this car was built, uh, striping had pretty generally fallen out of favor. Here's an example very late in the life of these cars. Canadian National purchased a number of cars Pullman considered obsolete in the first years of World War II, and they converted them to coaches for military traffic. Note again, the wider steel letterboard plated over the Gothic windows. Here's another example. This is a car that didn't get sold and it had received new sheathing in 1927 and was equipped with air conditioning in 1937. Notice that the lettering font has been modernized from what appeared in earlier photographs but the sides remain in Pullman green with golden letters. This car was retired and sold for scrap in 1964. By the time it, the photo was taken in 1962, it was one of three of this plan remaining in service. This car had a modification history almost identical to Gallup, but it is shown before the lettering was modified. Now, if we assume that this date here was the home show running from Sunday, Saturday to Sunday, this photo was probably taken in early 1952. Here's an example of the floor plan obtained from the Newbury Library collection. Note that all of the rooms in the car, except for compartment E, which I'm showing with my mouse here, had a connecting door to the adjacent room. This permitted sale of two adjacent rooms as a suite for larger parties. Other plan 2522 subplans had different connecting door arrangements. Uh, the 2522 E subplan was applied to a group of seven cars that were upgraded from original 2522. Among the upgrades were air conditioning and brake system updates. These cars had a very long history of assignment to the New York Central, beginning about 1914 on the Lakeshore Limited, period on the 20th Century Limited, very long period on the uh, Montreal and uh, international trains, period on the Wolverine, the trains to Toronto, and so forth. And the last 
documented instances are on the New York to Toronto trains where they were seen on a number of occasions in consist lists that can be obtained on the Canada Southern website. In the 19, late 1930s and early 1940s, the NYC would have needed four cars, assuming one in each of the consists, and four cars of 2522E and two 2522As that weren't so extensively modified were assigned during this period. It should be noted that Canada charged customs duty on a car if it remained in the country for more than 24 hours. So it was common for a car to arrive in Toronto in the morning on train 71 and depart later in the day on train 72. And these consist lists reflect that. Beginning in mid-December of 1940, two of the cars shown, Trianta and Waycross, were in seasonal service on the Atlantic coastline. The second subgroup of these cars, 2522C, were built in 1923. And as you can see from this drawing, the design had changed quite a bit. Three of the cars in this lot were assigned to initially to New York Central and Big Four. And I sort of suspect they would have run either from New York to uh, Cincinnati or New York to uh, St. Louis, but I don't have any documentation on that subject. Two cars received air, ice air conditioning for seasonal service to Florida on the Atlantic coastline, but they only ran one season. And they were replaced the next season with older cars, which had Pullman mechanical air conditioning. Probably there were problems with layovers in Florida where the cars got pretty hot. Um, I'd have to take issue with what's shown in this um, comments here because although they were seven cars were sold to the Pullman by the Pullman company, they weren't leased back. They went to various railroads and were used for other purposes. Here's an as-built example, President Roosevelt, which is one of the cars initially on service on the New York Central. By the time these cars were built, Pullman design provided only single windows along the aisle as opposed to pairs of windows. And note also the top equalizer type 242 trucks that were in vogue for about a three year period of Pullman construction in the early 1920s. As a detail of presentation, the masking technique for printing, printing exterior photos had also been discontinued. Here's a later example of such a car President Harrison, which was initially on the New York Central, but probably was in use elsewhere by the time ice air conditioning was applied. And although this car was re-equipped with drop equalizer trucks when air conditioned, by this point, it has the top equalizer trucks restored. In the post-war period, it was the only car of this subplan having air conditioning, which would have been deemed essential for regular assignments. The third plan, 2540, was eight compartments and an observation lounge. And it's probably the best known car for a couple of reasons we'll get into later. Nine cars were built to this plan in 1911 and construction began in 1917 on five similar cars in plan 2540A. But due to US entry into World War I, they were finished as 16 section cars instead, probably for military traffic. Designated as plan 2412X, they were slightly longer than other 16 section cars. Here's an early instance of such a car in service, a 20th century limited accident that occurred near Hyde Park, New York. And this information is taken from the Interstate Commerce Commission report. And the notable portion is here that the train consisted of the engine, a buffet car, four sleeping cars, one dining car, and one observation car, all of steel construction. And Watertown is obviously the observation car, which is lying on its side in shallow water. 
Plan 2505 car, Bay Pond, is also in the consist. And if the consist is listed in sequence, it's probably the second car in the group ahead of Watertown, the diner with the truss rod construction being between them. The accident wasn't terribly severe and Watertown was repaired and returned to service. Here's another instance of accident. Um, I think the thing to take away about the car is the fact this one had not been resheathed at the time of the accident. The Gothic windows are still seen in place. Um, this was an accident at Forsyth, New York. On the night of the accident, there were three sections of the westbound 20th Century Limited, which were being operated as the second, third, and fourth sections of train number five. And this was a device the New York Central used when running multiple sections of the 20th Century Limited to allow all but the last section to run ahead of the posted schedule. And this helped to enhance the chance of making on-time arrival for most, if not all, of the passengers. Um, again, the consist is listed. Two things notable, one, the observation car of Plan 2540, and another, the fact that there was no diner in the consist. The practice on the 20th Century Limited at that time was to switch the diner out westbound at Syracuse, New York, and then to pick one up at either Cleveland or Toledo in Ohio. And the process was reversed in the opposite direction. So coming back to the accident, the first section hit an automobile and stopped. The second section stopped for the flagman, picked it up and proceeded up to the point of the accident. The third section apparently was right in the yellow and it didn't stop and telescoped the observation car of the second section, Barnum, which was so badly damaged that it had to be scrapped. Five of the nine cars were remodeled and assigned different plan numbers in uh, the early 1920s. All eight of the surviving cars were rebuilt to plan 2540 with an enclosed vestibule replacing the open platform in 1937. At this time, a stepped pediment style rear end was applied, at least at the vestibule end, or the newly enclosed vestibule end, and the cars received air conditioning. This is car Geneva. The car behind it in the photo is an interesting little side life mystery. I can't think of a railroad name that includes the characters R-A-T. And the possibilities are further limited by the car name, which presumably ended in either House or Syracuse. So suggestions are welcome. Here is a view of the interior of the car after the rebuilding. Note that at this point, the rear door of the lounge is centered whereas in the original car it had been offset to the left side of the car as originally built. And this change was apparently made in the 1937 rebuilding. Regular assignments after this were seasonal Florida trains on the Atlantic coastline and seaboard airline railroads. Here's a view of plan 2540E Westboro after assignment. Note that there are now three wide windows in the lounge area and one less pair of compartment windows because the two rear compartments had been replaced by a buffet in this area and the expanded lounge area. Four cars were this modified in this way and assigned to the seaboard airline. Here's another view of the seaboard cars in the two-tone paint green paint scheme that was used for the Orange Blossom Special about 1948. It bears considerable similarities to New York Central's favorite scheme, but uh, the lettering font is different. 
Here's an example of the floor plans that are available on the Newberry Library site. And note the arrow here, it's possible to click it to get a full screen image and study the details of the plans. After Pullman service ended with these cars, Waldemere was sold to the Boston, Maine. They used it for a time as a baggage car and then degraded it down to work service. And John Horvath provided this photograph from my presentation. The four remaining cars were rebuilt to plan 2540F for Atlantic Coastline service. A buffet replaced compartment H, but there was no change to the window configuration. And it doesn't appear that Pullman took any photos after this remodeling was done, probably because there was little or no change in exterior appearance. Here's a comparison I put together trying to track how these cars reallocated the space from the back wall of compartment F to the vestibule. One of the cars, Tano, was removed from regular Pullman assignment in 1941 for use as part of the presidential train to travel during wartime. And in 1943, a secretary's room was carved out of the lounge area. It was designated as plans 2540G and 2540H during this period. In the presidential trains, its normal position was immediately ahead of Ferdinand Magellan, which was the armored presidential car. Tano was returned to plan 2540F, its pre-war configuration, and to normal service in 1946. Tano was readily at hand when FDR died in Warm Springs, Georgia, in April 1945, and its wide lounge windows allowed his casket to be displayed to the thousands of mourners who lined the tracks. The funeral train moved to Washington, where he lay in state in the Capitol, and then to the Roosevelt home at Hyde Park, where he was interred. Here's a photo of the funeral train passing, probably through South Carolina, based on the state flag. And Clemson or Greenville were visited on this. Here's a photo of the military honor guard surrounding his casket in the car. Here's a view as the funeral train was backing into Washington Uni Union Station. Notice that the lounge window had been opened to facilitate removal of the casket. And here it's being loaded onto the horse-drawn hearse. The last plan we're going to touch on is 2413, six compartments in an observation lounge. Although 23 cars of this plan were built in 1910, only four had New York Central service on the Wolverine slash Detroiter. <coughs> this would have run from about 1911 to 1915. Brookview, Chaumont, Nahasi, and Neodak. They apparently were not assigned to New York Central after World War I. The remaining cars were rebuilt for Pennsylvania. And as they were retired relatively early, the Newberry Library doesn't have a floor plan. If one could be found, it'd be interesting to compare the amenities with the New York Central's observation car plan 2540. Here's a view of the accommodations that were in use in these cars and a taste of the decor that was used. Pullman cars of the period offered four types of accommodations. Parlor seats on daytime runs. Sections consisting of two facing seats on one side of the car, which converted into an upper and lower berth at night and with curtains providing privacy. Compartments, an upgraded accommodation primarily offered on major markets for all Pullman trains, where the seating and sleeping accommodations of a section were enclosed in a room extending most of the width of the car, except for an aisle. And a private sink and toilet were enclosed within this compartment adjacent to the door. 
At the top of the pecking order, drawing room enclosed, moved the toilet and sink to a separate annex with an additional window, which was usually frosted for privacy. And the door to the, from the room to the aisle was opposite the annex. There was a sofa running longitudinally, which converted to a third bed. A window above the sofa allowed passengers to view out the opposite side of the car through the aisle if desired. Here's another view showing the window to the aisle with the curtain closed, showing the communicating door to the um, next accommodation in a corner of the section seat. Generally the same upholstery was used in all rooms of a car in a particular lot, but varied quite a bit from one lot to another based on the tastes of the railroad to which a group of them were planned to be assigned. This photo also shows a drawing room, but of 1916 vintage. And as you can see, Pullman's interior decor evolved over the years, tending to follow current fashion trends, both in the design for new cars and in refurbishing of those they already had, just like an upscale hotel that has to upgrade to keep up with the market. During the depression, Pullman installed air conditioning on most of the cars having regular assignments. And while they were in the shops for this purpose, they were also refurbished and repainted. And wood grain interiors, like the one shown here, were painted over generally with beige or tan. Here's a view of a compartment. Pullman Company photographers for seemingly took photographs of the drawing rooms and of the sleeping parlor of sections more frequently than they did of the compartments, even in cars that had all three. These are among the few exceptions I've been able to find, and they show a later car than the ones immediately under discussion, but give a taste for the type of decor after air conditioning was installed in 1934. Note the open washbowl, the fold-out toilet, and mirror. I'm going to touch a little bit on the past, the brakes of these cars. Four different systems were applied in the car under discussion. And in chronological order, they're the PM simplest system, consisting of one valve, one reservoir, and one cylinder. The LN scheme upgraded this, providing separate service and emergency reservoirs and a more complex valve that allowed for faster braking in emergency situations. The PC brake system with separate service and emergency cylinders, both of which operated on both trucks, was another attempt to provide faster braking on fast trains. And oddly enough, in most cases, the PC system the cylinders were of different sizes. Pullman kept experimenting and in 1916, came up with the UC scheme, which was standard for heavyweight Pullman's build after 1917. The PM, LN, and UC systems were built in both one cylinder and two cylinder versions. And on those schemes, if there were two cylinders. One cylinder worked on the brakes of each truck. Having a mix of braking systems in a particular train was a headache because the LN and PC systems were refinements to improve brake performance when making an emergency stop, which became important as speeds increased and multiple sections were being run on short headway. But if such cars were mixed with cars having the PM system, uneven braking could occur and cars would run in in the slack and couplers when a stop occurred and they'd bump against each other. Most cars with the PC system were modified in the late 1920s to provide a graduated release feature and designated PCM in Pullman records. Other cars were designed, changed to the UC system get away from the complications. So here's a picture of the PM scheme, which was essentially 
the same as the K brake, freight car brakes that were being used at the time, except that the reservoir and the cylinder are separate. Here's the LN scheme. Note adding the supplementary reservoir. And I type L triple valve. Here's the PC scheme that I mentioned. And while it may well have performed, there were an awful lot of links and pins to keep adjusted and lubricated. And it was probably pretty complex to work on. So some railroads liked them, including New York Central, which had a long history of installing them on cars that it built for itself. But um, other railroads stayed away from them. Here's the UC scheme that was generally regarded as the state of the art after it was developed and lasted until the throughout the period of heavyweight car construction. Now, you might ask, why do we care about passenger car brakes? Well, for one thing, they're a visible detail on the model and worthy of getting it right. And unfortunately, few models that we see commercially have anything other than a UC single cylinder brake scheme, whether or not the car in question had that. The brakes assigned a particular car frequently are a hint at what railroad the car was built for. As I mentioned, New York Central liked PC brakes, and hence he didn't, probably due to different operational patterns. Here's a summary of the cars built to plan 2505, and I've used orange shading to show those that I believe were built for New York Central assignment, although in the last lot, it says they were built for general service, but both the names and the brake selection suggests that they were probably New York Central. The information in the Pullman car database that Tom Madden graciously made available shows that all of the initial eight had PM brake system, but the records elsewhere indicate that these last four had LM schemes, and they were the first four received PC brakes by 1925, consistent with New York Central preferences. The first four names are locations in the Adirondacks, and the latter four locations in Ohio and Indiana and Pennsylvania. The more numerous seven compartment, two drawing room cars. Many lots were clearly built for railroads other than New York Central, but at least a few were probably built in the, for the New York Central or at least assigned there quite early. Because again, their brake schemes were changed to type PC at dates up to 1926. In addition, the three that I mentioned earlier of the last lot, plan 2522C, um, are highlighted. I should mention on these cars in the first lot, they had shopping dates in the Buffalo shops, 1917 to 1919 period, and very likely that was the point at which their brakes were changed. The last group, the eight compartment observation cars, all were built for New York Central Service, and the brakes were changed to type PC beginning in 1912, essentially immediately after the scheme was developed. Pullman lines. The Pullman Operating Department designated round trip service between a particular city pair on a particular set of trains as a line. And unfortunately, these lines were usually not shown in either the official guide or the applicable railroad's public timetables. So it's frequently hard to make good use of this information. Uh, 
a car could operate in more than one line in a continuous trip, and it could operate in a different line when it was returning. And more than one car could operate within a given line. I'll show examples in a moment. Pullman's 1915 schedule of lines was reprinted by Arthur Dubin, but even the reprints are very difficult to find. I was fortunate to have access to a copy at the Illinois Railway Museum. Here's a sample listing for line 1500 on the Lakeshore Limited. Note that in addition to giving the specific limited train that this line was assigned to, it says that it consisted of both sleeping and compartment observation cars. It summarizes the train schedule on the westbound and the eastbound runs. It also notes that there was a buffet car reported under a different line and talks a little about the complications of how this car operated. Here's a summary from that same listing of Pullman lines with all room cars as of July 15, 1915. The 20th Century Limited is probably the simplest since the cars went west and returned east on the same train. Um, four cars were required to cover this New York and any New York to Chicago line at that time. But there was also a car that ran on the Lakeshore Limited westbound and it returned on the eastbound train number six and the times permitted two cars to cover the line. Um, the New York to Chicago compartment observation car that we saw on the Um, earlier, the so uh, um, six compartment cars was probably uh, was operated in three stages or sections. First, westbound from New York to Chicago. Then it returned from Chicago to Detroit overnight and laid over during the day. And then was connected to the Detroiter leaving in the evening and ran back to New York. So three cars would have been required to cover this service. Um, many of us are modelers and these cars represent an unmet need in the modeling. There are plastic car models of heavyweight cars that focused on generic cars of the late era built between 1923 and 1932. And these are readily distinguished because they were one foot longer than the earlier cars which gave Pullman a little increase in the revenue space. And typically they used this to replace a compartment with a drawing room and increase the potential revenue from each trip. So all room car plans built between 1923 and 1930 included the plan 20, 35, 23 cars, six compartments and three drawing rooms. Initially cars of this type had names with names of composers and authors, and later lots had names beginning Glenn, Glenn Echo, Glenn Ellen, and so forth. Plan 3959 replaced previous observation car designs with three compartments and two drawing rooms. In New York Central Service, the car names began Central, this, that, and the other. Lastly, Plan 3583 was a seven drawing room car. It was dined initially for Santa Fe trains between Chicago and Los Angeles and later applied to the 20th Century Limited. Now, even if you look back at the Walther's tin plate kits of the 1980s, the only cars that are built available based on pre-1923 prototypes were various cars having sections. And um, these just don't fit the cars we're looking at. The only brass model I've been able to find for any of these cars is a Soho model that claims to be 
Plan 2522C, President Washington. And the photos from an eBay listing of this car are listed, shown, and I've identified some shortcomings. On the room side of the cars, the single windows for drawing rooms should be here where there is one and here, fine, but none in the middle. There were no drawing rooms in the middle that would have had annexes. There should be a second single window at the right end with a general toilet. So there's one single window too many and they're in the wrong place. Um, the single windows are appropriate for both 2522C as well as the earlier lot 2522B, but they're more evenly spaced, not bunched together as shown here. The president cars, plan 2522C, were built with a pediment end, which is not shown here, and top equalizer trucks. And although President Harrison received drop equalizer trucks when it was air conditioned, this is not an air conditioned car. There's no duct on either side of the Claire story. In addition, although the model has two battery boxes um, and a single brake cylinder, there should be another air reservoir for the UC air brake system on the late cars that this car supposedly is labeled for. The modeling in any case is quite simplified because brake shoes, brake levers, rods, and airlines are not modeled. These errors are not evident in the Traeger drawing shown by Karsten, but he does depict the car. He does not depict the car ends. Here is a very nice drawing by John Fisella of Kano, Plan 2540F. Note that he shows it with the buffet and the enclosed vestibule as opposed to plans G and H where it was modified for service during World War II. Alex, you have about five minutes. Thank you. Here's another very nice model, probably from a very limited layout because it's one to 32 scale of Cardinal Bonzano, the Cardinals train temporary use. And um, it's shown in Theodore Schrady's interesting book, The Sleeping Car. Here's an overview of the references and sources that I used in developing this presentation. William Foster's 1923 calendar painting is something we've probably all seen in various contexts <clears throat> as the centuries pass in the night. And I think it's fitting into this discussion. The car shown is a planned 2540 observation car. And in 1923, it was in its last months of assignment to the century, but it will continue in less prominent roles for decades to come. I'm now finished and look forward to your questions. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing, I guess. A question for Alex just came up. Who were Pullman's primary competitors? Okay, in the period under discussion, Pullman didn't have any competition. They simply ran essentially all sleeping car service in the United States and a large share, essentially, all service in Mexico and a large share in uh, Canada. Now, I'm less familiar with who ran what in Canada. I accept the fact that both Canadian Pacific and Canadian National had some Pullman lines, as well as some services they ran themselves. Um, Pullman basically bought out its competitors. Uh, the Wagner car lines, which had formerly been run by the New York Central being an example which they bought out about 1900 before the period of the steel cars we're discussing in this presentation. Uh, they were broken up in um, 1945 in a antitrust judgment prompted by the Bud Company, 
which resented being locked out of the market for constructing sleeping cars. And at that point, operations were split off into the Pullman Company and car building into Pullman Standard Car and Manufacturing. And those companies went their separate ways. Thank you, Alex. Well, thank you all for your interest and attention.